Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first storytelling webinar anywhere in the world. Uh, this special Halloween event is brought to you by the Center for Creative Communications, part of Centennial College in Toronto, Canada. The center is the home of the School of Creative Media and Design, whose motto is interactive storytelling in many forms. This event was conceived by the school's visionary dean, Nate Horowitz. Our show has many dimensions today. As moderator, I'm going to moderate, and five storytellers will be interacting with a live audience of center students. That's you. We are streaming in video and audio over the web from centennialcollege.ca slash future slash storytellingwebinar.jsp. In other words, we're live, just like in the early days of broadcast TV. And to quote the immortal words of Count Floyd from Monster Chiller Horror Theater, a feature on the SCVT series, Ooh, that's scary. What you see is what you'll get, warts and all. Throughout this two-hour event, we also welcome questions and comments, not only from our live audience, but from people out there on the web at our email address, which is storytelling at centennialcollege.ca. As questions and comments come in over the web, I'll read them out to the audience and to our storytellers. And if you have questions or comments, I'll repeat them so that people on the web can hear them over the stream. There is also a blog site at http colon slash slash tc hyphen centos, c-e-n-t-o-s, dot the center, and that's spelled c-e-n-t-r-e, dot centennial college dot c-a slash wordpress. There you can see the complete biographies on our five participants and myself. And also there's a blog there that will be open for the next two weeks. So uh, during this event and once this event is over, people can add comments, questions, stories of their own to the blog, and the participants will also be checking in and adding to that as well. So today we bring you stories and insights into storytelling by five creative people who teach at or are associated with the center. All of them are active in various media. So I'm just going to introduce them briefly and then you'll hear more about them and from them as we go along. First of all, Rita Deverell, broadcaster and theater artist. Chris Terry, at the end there with the guitar, singer, songwriter, director and producer. Dennis Murphy, in the middle, director, producer and murder mystery writer. Ted Barris, journalist and historian with The Poppy. And Mark O'Connell, in the dark jacket, fine artist and fashion designer. I invite you to read their biographies at our blog site and get a sense of their many contributions and awards and just how versatile they all are. I'm John Outen. Although I've published a lot of poetry and journalism, my storytelling credits are more limited. I did write one episode, the cover-up, of the old Degrassi Junior High series, which was shot here at the center, or most of it was. And under the pseudonym J.K. Rowling, I've written the Harry <laughs> Potter books. Okay, I made that up. The people you can't see without whom this event would not happen are Lisa Hurst, director, camera person, and podcaster back there on the riser, Rob Hart, IT uh, network specialist, Larry Farr, video streaming and project coordinator, Steve Lazenby, setup, broadcast technologist, Sam Frumeni, basic setup and production assistant, and he's a student, and Kevin Clark, setup and audio board, another student. So let's uh, just talk briefly about what we're doing today and then we'll start doing it. One requirement that fiction such as literature, television, comedy and drama series and feature movies share with nonfiction genres like journalism, history and documentaries is telling a good story. In fact, journalist slang for a news or feature article is the story. To give a coherent account of events, whether real or imagined, demands talent, skill and practice. A dictionary might tell you that a story is a series of events involving a few characters set in one or more places over a limited period of time. But the art of storytelling demands more than the bare bones of events. Readers and viewers appreciate storytellers' sense of which details to give, which events to start and end with, how to build suspense and surprise, and what information to withhold from the audience until the critical moment. Today, we're asking five creators associated with the center to tell you a story or two and to reflect on how they find and tell stories. We'll start today with each contributor taking around five minutes 
to give you a taste of a story, sometimes in the form of a song or, or visual art. I'll attempt to lead a discussion of that contributor's story and insights into the story making and telling process. Then we'll move on to another contributor and see what comes next. So the one thing I can promise you today is variety. Country songs, crime fiction, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, how the drama of war unfolds in memory and narrative, and lots of other things. So I'm going to ask Rita Deverall to lead off. Rita. The getaway car was a BMW, a BMW sports car, to be exact, one of those two-seaters. I had just watched in the rear-view mirror that convertible top slide down so smoothly behind me, as smooth as a smoothie, uh, une framboise, a uh, smoothie. Uh, in my part of the world, we're trilingual. So I was all ready for a disaster. I knew exactly what I had to bring. I watched the gas gauge go up to full, and in the one seat beside me, I wanted a two-seater because, as the old blues man said, I don't want any trash beside me. So in the one seat beside me was the New York Times, uh, the Sunday edition, um, a man-sized white fluffy towel. I had given that to myself. Now, the car was a chick magnet. And so also beside me was a wicker picnic hamper with uh, pate, with cheese, with wine. This was given to me by a chick in case of an emergency. And this was definitely an emergency. Uh, also a very warm Hudson Bay blanket. That was given to me by a chick in Canada. So I'm now all set and ready. Now, lots of people are waving to me because they think I've got a spare seat. It's obvious, isn't it? I don't have a spare seat. I am out of here, a streak of power. There's no room for anyone else. The next getaway car was a Ford. I've always had a Ford. My daddy had a Ford. My granddaddy had a Ford. A Ford is good enough for me. Now, I knew what had to go in this car. Emergency stuff. Warm clothes. Four sleeping bags for the kids and for us. Toys. Well, I mean, toys might seem kind of silly, but we didn't know how long we were going to be gone, and the kids would need toys, food, emergency rations. I've been in the Army. I know about emergency rations. Powdered eggs, crackers, spam, water, juice, emergency food. I'm awfully glad Mom and Pop aren't alive to see this disaster, or Fred's Mom and Pop. They'd never evacuate anyway. And so just as we're all piled into the car, me, Fred, the two kids, all of the provisions, all of a sudden we see Dorothy running down the road, screaming, waving her arms around. I say to the kids, Okay, no problem. Pile those sleeping bags on your laps. Then there'll be room for Dorothy. I got up and I hugged her like I hadn't seen her in 20 years, though I had just seen her in two hours. Of course we had room for our neighbor. And then we were out of there. The final getaway car was a tin can. I'd never had a car before. Mama was really proud of me that I was able to get a car. It was 
a tin can. I think it had enough gas, and I knew what it had to have in it. I'd read in the newspaper, we needed food, we needed bottled water, we needed warm clothes, though I can't figure out why we needed warm clothes, because it was so hot that the clothes that were on my back were crawling off. And the thing is, piled on top, piled on top of this little getaway car was Mama's hope chest. Well, we certainly needed hope. And, and then a wood stove full of the clothes because we were going to drive north. I was the driver. I decided we were going to drive north, follow the north star. And then we all piled in, Mama, me, the neighbors, the tailors, the fullers. The car was full, the hope chest on the top. And I don't know what went wrong. The car just sunk. It sputtered gas. Maybe we weren't supposed to get out of here. When Katrina came and grabbed us, we just sank. Now, I've never been able to resist a woman who wanted to grab me, and this was no exception. Only the rich talk about being burdened by their possessions. The rest of us know that we do want to take it with us. And that's exactly what we were doing. Like those, like those Egyptians with all of their stuff around them in their tomb, we didn't get away. Rita, can I ask you where the germ of the story was? We, we all watched the Hurricane Katrina events and coverage, but what turned it into a story for you first? Was it a voice you heard from one of your characters, an image? I think first I have to tell you uh, why Hurricane Katrina has been on my mind at all. Uh, as everybody knows, it happened uh, more than two years ago. And um, I was director of news and current affairs at APTN, Aboriginal People's Television Network, in Winnipeg when the hurricane hit. Um, so I watched, now I, I grew up in the U.S. South, in Houston, so I know a lot about uh, Louisiana, and I know a lot about Texas, and uh, young and perky though I look, I was born in 1945, which means I went to a completely segregated school system until the end of high school. Um, and uh, Texas, contrary to uh, opinion, is a southern state. It is not a western state. It is a southern state and uh, has a very violent uh, history, in fact, of, of racism. Okay, in any case, the hurricane hits, and I'm, for the first four days, looking at uh, the pictures of all of these black people on the front page of the Globe and Mail trapped in the Superdome. And I'm starting to literally become unhinged because nobody is asking in the first four days why all of these people are black. And to me, they looked like they had gotten about five steps uh, from the slave quarters. So, on the fifth day, I wrote to my boss, the CEO of APTN, and I said, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this, uh, but I'm seeking your permission to write an op-ed piece for the Globe and Mail because I'm becoming unhinged uh, uh, that nobody is talking about the racism, classism, uh, etc. Uh, in this hurricane evacuation. So even though it's early on a Saturday morning, my boss, the CEO, who's an Aboriginal person, writes me back and says, um, this is disturbing me greatly too. 
and here's how I think I can give you my permission. You're the outgoing director of news <laughs> and current affairs, so you can have an opinion and you can write your thing. So I come out onto the street and the Globe and Mail has come out for that day and the banner headline is racism, classism, etc. because Christy Blatchford has gone to Louisiana and this is what her story is about. So I think, uh, thank God, I'm not the only smart person in the world. I don't have to do this. It's not up to me to call the attention of the world uh, to what's really going on with this story. Um, however, it didn't go away for me. So at this very moment, and what you just heard, I wrote for this webinar, um, and it will go someplace in a play that I am working on about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, but tying this to precarious Aboriginal communities in Canada, especially around water issues. Now, I'm telling you an awful lot very fast, but what has started to concern me is that we have spent an awful lot of time looking down south and saying, we'd never do anything like that. We wouldn't be that stupid. We wouldn't be that corrupt. We wouldn't treat people as if they lived in the third world, in the first world. So I'm going to do something that says, um, yeah, we would, we do, we have. And I told you that whole part about APTN because I think had I not been working at APTN uh, and had we not done a terrific number of stories about some northern First Nations that, were, uh, that had to evacuate uh, because of their living conditions, uh, the second one is the only one that really made the press in a significant way. Um, had it not been the, co the convergence of the hurricane happening for me when I was being director of news and current affairs at APTN, I wouldn't have connected these dots. So that's what my next project is about. Thank you. Anyone in the audience have a question or comment about what Brita has just been talking about? disaster is it that uh, hit Native people? Oh, the, the one that I specifically referred to is uh, Cassetuan. However, that's not, that's not the only one. You'll remember that was a community... Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. That was a community that floods every year in northern Ontario. Is it because of hydropower? Or? Uh, no, it's just because of where it's located. Um, one of the things that we don't spend a lot of time talking about is uh, most First Nations communities have been relocated from some place that it was favorable to live to some place where it wasn't. So uh, uh, reserves or reservations are not where people have chosen to live. And one of the reasons it's so difficult to make a living in these places is because frequently it's very poor land, it's highly undesirable land, et cetera, et cetera. So this community, uh, I think this happened about, well, I, actually it happened this spring too. So the community floods in the spring. And um, this was front page news. They, they were airlifted uh, to, I think, Thunder Bay. But um, this is just, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. There are, at last count, I think, more than 90, nine zero, Aboriginal communities under boiled water advisories. So uh, one thing that my team, and my news team, was all Aboriginal except for me. I had been hauled in as uh, the boss to get a daily show on the road. Uh, so I did. I got that daily show on the road. You can watch APTN National News Monday to Friday at uh, 7 o'clock Eastern. Um, one of the things that my team, the reporters, would go around saying is if Walkerton 
had happened in an Aboriginal community, nothing would have happened. It just would have been business as usual. But the fact that five white people died meant that we had a big inquiry and so on and so forth. Great. Thank you. Okay, I feel like the guy on Monty Python, and now for something completely different, but that's what this is about. Chris is going to favor us with the song, I believe. All right. stops as the crowd moves away A baby boy cries on the other side The father preaches the gospel of pain While the teacher considers her time with demise The lover turns her face to the rain. The security man turns the circle again. The painter holds his brushes down. And I tell myself it's no concern to lie. Get in line You're not the only one Get in line Get in line Get in line A barefoot boy barely remembers his name. The messenger zips his bundle inside. As Agnes sorts her life in his piles, so line up out here. Get in line, get in line, get in line, get in
Chris, you've worked in uh, documentaries uh, a lot and in other forms of uh, TV and movies. What's the challenge in telling a story in a song as opposed to those visual and sound formats you used to? Um, yeah, it's a different way of doing things. I've been used to working in nonfiction television in the documentary vein, which involves you know gathering facts and doing a lot of research and filtering down to find a story out of a lot of uh, input. Uh, you know, <laughs> somebody I was talking to yesterday said it's called data retrieval. Kind <laughs> <laughs> of an odd way to put it, but I guess it is that way. Um, I guess. Like in this case, this song, it, it, it was a reaction to something, which you, you can't really do in the documentary vein. You can react to things, I suppose, if you're Michael Moore and you want to um, editorialize the, the idea to the point that it becomes a kind of a, an entertainment venue, which is kind of where I'm going with songwriting, which is to turn it into something more um, tangential and refer to things in a different way. So I guess the change for me, uh, it's a sort of an outlet, I guess, working so many years in, in uh, nonfiction to kind of some, somewhat take the nonfiction stuff and try to do something else with it. So like this song, um, Get In Line, was, was kind of a reaction to be on strike last year, which, you know, uh, we were all on strike uh, in March of 2000. And and six, uh, if you were students here, you would know that. Um, and uh, a, a couple of things kind of came up while I was standing on the line. <laughs> you know, uh, that that you know later on when you f reflect back on things, you kind of have a, a perspective on it that maybe you didn't at the time. But um, I started thinking about you know you know what it would meant to be on a strike line, which I'd never been on before. And um, of course, during the during that time, there was a, a tragedy. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, uh, died from a, an unfortunate accident, and it, it, not that this song in any way tries to explain that, because that's not what it was about. But it certainly became part of the song, and I fictionalized, in my own mind anyway, uh, sort of a, a sequence of events that, in turn, just brought up other ideas. So you know, like I think that's the. You know, I, I guess in a roundabout way, I'm, what I'm saying is it's just it's another way for me to kind of approach um, the nonfiction you know, the songs. Sometimes, and sometimes, and I think I said this to Rita, which is, you know, often we, we, we in, in songwriting, and I think it's somewhat true in, in uh, the theater as well. You take things that happen to you or happen around you, and you reflect on them. You know? what we do. <laughs> so, um, one of the interesting things that happened, like that I, that I kind of thought of when I was working on this song was um, a friend of mine, uh, his father had passed away and his mother um, was moving from Vancouver to Toronto and um, she was quite elderly and uh, she had to uproot her entire life to come here. And I'd gotten to know her over the years. She's quite a, an interesting woman. And uh, there was quite a to-do around getting all her stuff lined up, you know, literally lined up to come here because what was going to come here was her life. And yeah, I only have one line in the song, which is Ag as Agnes sorts her life into piles, but, you know, literally, you know, the meaning of that to me is that, you know, I, I understood and, know, and knew this, this person who was a lovely person and she uprooted her entire life to come to a place and you know she's 90 years old and to, to sort your life into piles is kind of a you know it's a kind of a, a huge thing to do you know and I could write a whole song about that I guess <laughs> um, and uh, you know other things you know other things around lines came up as well so that's kind of my my reason good yeah. thanks anyone in the audience here yes Yeah, she's. She's well, asked uh, Chris to talk about what it means to be on the strike line to him. Yeah, um, it was an unnerving experience, partly because there was a tragedy, but also because the, you know, and if you're ever in this situation, um, you know, you're unsure of the future in a way that directly affects you in, and your colleagues um, right at the, the bottom line, which is. You know, we were on strike for nearly a month, 
and I know that myself, I live month, month to month. Yes. Yeah, whole months, <laughs> pardon me. I, I, I live month to month, as many people do, and I, I know lots of families that live month to month. They, you know, the, the, the myth is we don't have, you know, deep pockets. Uh, you know, we literally cave in after a month. You know, and we all, I mean, it was quite serious at that time. We all started to realize that, uh, you know, the consequences uh, down the road. It, could, it didn't drag on, and I think, you know, our, you know, our management managed it reasonably well, but, it, you know, in the end, it, you know, you reflect on that as being, you know, what, what happens to people who are out on strike for months? You know, I, you know, I know people that have gone through that, you know, and it's, uh, it ruins people's lives, you know, so that was part of it, you know. Also, just, I mean, it was the middle of winter, and, you know, we, I mean, I, several of the people on this panel, I were, Ted and I were on the line together, and, you know, I mean, you, you learn about things in a different way on a strike line. I can't really um, tell you that it's, it's, it's not a pleasurable experience, but we certainly bond in a strike line, and that part of it is really interesting. Um, we have a, a, a wonderful group of people that we work with, and I appreciated that more. So, you know, you, you, every negative has a positive in some way, and so, you know, like, so I get to meet a lot of people that I hadn't had any contact with before, and, um, you know, just met met some great people. How long have you been playing guitar for? How long has uh, you been playing guitar for? I have a confession to make. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a drummer, and um, uh, <laughs> if you didn't notice, I make mistakes. <laughs> uh, I play in a band, and uh, actually, our bass player is standing right back there, Steve, our, our uh, maintenance guy. Uh, <laughs> and I have played in bands over the years, on and off, for many years. Uh, Stopped for a long time, and um, I, I always been interested in songwriting. I had done some songwriting before, and about five years ago, uh, with this band I was working with, we started to get, you know, more serious about it, and we started writing songs. And I, you know, I had a rudimentary understanding of piano, and I was writing songs on piano. And uh, it's a guitar band. <laughs> so I so come in with a song and I go, well, I, you know, I play it on the piano like this. And they'd look at me like, oh, geez, you have to put it in that key, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I learned guitar. Um, I started uh, just about two years ago um, to, to try and help my bandmates learn my songs. <laughs> Do you want to plug the name of your band before we move yeah, on? Yeah, my to band Venice? is called Lost Anglers. And... Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're, I would say, uh, we're getting our shit together. Excuse the term. <laughs> we're, we have, uh, we have uh, six members, and uh, we play usually one gig a month. That's about what we've been doing. So. Is everybody writing songs in the band? Uh, uh, no. We have four of us write songs. So four six storytellers. Us, four out of six, yeah. Oh. If I could just remind the people out there on the web, if, if any, if you want to send in a, a comment or a question, the address is storytelling, one word, at centennialcollege.ca, and then I'll get the participants to respond to whatever you say. Um, I'm going to ask Dennis Murphy to go next, uh, director, producer, murder mystery writer, pinstripe suit wearer. <laughs> this is a, uh, an excerpt. I don't have props. Guitar, I don't stand up. Uh, um, uh, an excerpt from a short story. It's a short story with three main characters in it, uh, all of whom appear uh, in this this excerpt. Uh, unlike a song or a theatrical piece, I can't deliver the complete thing unless you have a couple of days for me to read it. But, uh, I'll, I'll read bits of this short story. And, and I can read other bits if, uh, if it doesn't explain itself. It's called Fuzzy Wuzzy uh, from the poem Fuzzy Wuzzy Head Bear. Uh, and the metaphor behind the, the story, uh, and there always is one in the story, um, is uh, people not being what they seem. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't but Radical Ray loved homeless Ramona better than crack cocaine. So when he found her face up in the pond behind 1279 Briarthorn, he cried real tears for the first time since Daisy. Ray met homeless Ramona in the spring after that first hard winter. 
when the food bank was still at the old warehouse at the bottom of Taylor, where it meets the lake. Thursday mornings are divvy day. If you show up on time and help divide up the weekly donations, you get first pick of the food. Ray, the general, the two grizzled guys from the subway grade above Scully Street Station, and Mrs. Pooney with her multicolored children were there early on that cold March morning. Their stained white breath mixed with the mint sweet steam of volunteer ladies who'd spent the night in queen size beds. Pretty women, clean hair tied back with iron ribbons, wearing bright silk scarves, puffy down coats with the labels on the outside, and new warm work socks with red wool edges. Pale lemon sun poured in from the unwashed clear story windows high above and shafts of dust motes visibly lit the small group in a sepia canvas of industrial workers before revolutions passed or yet to come. Canned goods on one wooden pallet, pasta on another. Canned goods, pasta. Canned goods, pasta. Homeless Ramona arrived late and didn't help. She stood erect beside her silver wire buggy surveying the process, arms pressed to her sides, hands stuffed in deep pockets. Ray felt ill that day, like most days. He watched her out of the crusty corner of one eye. Her green giant velour hat was pulled down to meet a scarf the color of toffee, so all he could see was a few wisps of pasta-colored hair and her eyes, shiny black olives that darted left and right, watching every move like an anxious chef with a new apprentice. Her cloth coat hung heavily to ankles clad in worn leather hiking boots, good ones with hooks instead of holes at the top, so the laces could be easily tightened. The coat was once green, or maybe gray, with large lapels and oversized cuff sleeves, chic, even expensive in its day. When Ramona saw Ray pick up the box of chocolate-covered digestive biscuits, she chirped a soft but insistent cough, a barely audible kick. <laughs> Volunteers and homeless looked up, puppets on a single string, string, to see her raised arm and extended index finger. She wore knitted gloves, the kind where you could pull the fingertips off to make change or pick up a cigarette butt. Her imperial pointer poking from the wool like a sparrow's head from a Boy Scout birdhouse. Angled slightly down at the precise degree, her eyes looked down her nose. Ray felt compelled to look at the cookies in his hand, then up to her fixed stare. She nodded confirmation, the starling's short, sharp dip of the head, and he walked toward her, hypnotized to hand her the box. While the volunteers stood stunned in reverent recognition of real refinement, the homeless stole the opportunity to pack their pockets with the choice stuff zip top single servings of sweet caramel custard, a jumbo geek can of Mr. Gouda's black bean soup, a foil pan of Jiffy Pop, a stale Snickers bar. Somewhere inside the jumble of old clothes and attitude was a woman worth knowing, thought Ray. Head pounding and nose dripping, every joint aching from self-abuse, he shuffled to catch up with Ramona where the row of portable toilets guarded the back end of the loading bay. Excuse me, ma'am, he said. He hadn't called anyone ma'am since Graham had insisted on it. Ramona stopped. Shorter by a foot, she still seemed to look down on him. May I help you, young man? She even sounded like Graham, like the Queen Mother, with a superiority, with some attitude born of somewhere Ray would never go. Them, uh, them cookies you got there are some damn d darn good, ma'am. Ray hadn't thought out what he wanted to say. Ramona said nothing. We had those same ones in the cupboard. No response. He started to sweat. Shiny black olives looked into his unwiped, watery eyes, and he had to look away before summoning the strength to look back. The top cupboard, man. Higher than me and Davy could reach. Back in Gander. Back before Davy drowned. Back before the troubles began. Do you take drugs, young man? Ray went hot, like his brain was blushing like his words were as visible as his breath, like they could be examined, tested, disproved, until all secrets were revealed. Yes, ma'am. You're stupid. She pronounced it stupid. Yes, ma'am. So stop it. It's foolish. It's a fraud, and you needn't be. She turned away,
pulling her buggy past the toilets, pushing down hard on the heavy metal exit bar of the steel door, disappearing into the frenzied flurries of the morning. Ray watched after her, legs heavy like an old man's, heart soaring like a boy's, fat with feeling, embarrassed by acquaintance, shamed by a failure to appear mature. Yes, ma'am, he said to himself, a strong voice, unheard for a long time. Are you friggin' coming or not? The general yelled from the street end of the huge bay, voice reverberating into a muddy murmur like public address apologies for delayed trains. <laughs> Fuzzy Wuzzy has been published, hasn't it? Yeah, and it, it was, yeah eventually it was. Uh, I, I've written this several short stories. They're all crime stories. The, the general ends up in this one uh, murdering uh, Ramona uh, primarily because he feels uh, attention. To, uh, he's losing Davy to her and he's unsettled by it. And, uh, and she also exposes something about the general he'd rather not have known. Uh, but I, I wanted I had done a series of short stories not, none of them related at all except in uh, in, 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 in metaphor maybe uh, and a, it was a magazine in story, called Storyteller in Ottawa, nice little magazine uh, whereas if you're trying to get in line for a, a, a prize for getting published they, they're, they're quite kind they're, they're very loose in publishing so I managed to sneak a story in there and it was a, a fictional story. I, I too am a factual filmmaker uh, and ex-newspaper journalist, um, and I've lived my life telling truths. So this is an opportunity for me to to, to lie. <laughs> I, have a, I have a great book at home. I can't remember the, the writer's name. He is a is a crime writer, and his tell it's, it's the book is called Telling Lies for Fun and Profit. It's a very, very good book. Uh, so I had to learn how to tell lies. At, to, to make the stories more than reports and the way that data processing Chris was talking about uh, collection um, and so I decided that I wanted to write a story on on the uh, you know the sort of the ephemerality of, of celebrity I was getting really tired of Paris Hilton and Brittany and everything like that so I thought <laughs> I thought about Canadian here and I thought Tom Thompson and I realized not only had he been ostensibly murdered that was a good story but the, but the fact that he had only been painting for five or six years, and his celebrity was, to me, rather elevated beyond his experience. So I wrote a story about a guy from Algonquin Park who, who finds offense uh, to Tom Thompson coming there and more or less stealing his park from him. Storyteller published in a minute. It just pressed their buttons. It was Canadian. It was short as a story. Um, it, whatever their criteria were, bought it. So then, and I and it won the prize for the best story of the year. <laughs> it wasn't difficult. <laughs> the, uh, Tell that to the folks who lost. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also was, was nominated for this Arthur Ellis Award, which 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 has weight in, in his prestigious from the crime writers. So the next year, I thought, well, I'll do that again. That's a way to get a story done. So I wrote a short story uh, called "Death of a Dry Stone Wall." Uh, which is an Acadian story. It takes place somewhere on the Quebec, New Brunswick border. And it's about when it, there's a missing generation in this family, and so therefore the old stories um, are skipped. Uh, the, the, the missing generation is the person who's not there. The old part of, of this, the man who still withholds all the stories in his heart uh, is the oldest man in, in town, the Saint-Marie de Mont, uh, which I think St. Mary of the Missing. <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, and he's senile and, and he does not speak. And so we we learn through pictures of his mind. Well, bang, uh, Canadian, Acadian uh, history in the diaspora and so on like that. Storyteller, bang, publish it. Second year, first prize mm. in the thing. Great, nominated for an Arthur Ellis Award, doesn't win. Yeah. Third year, I thought, I'm going for the hat trick. So I wrote Fuzzy Buzz. I thought, okay, this time we got Algonquin Park and we've got, well, let's go to Ontario, let's do a Toronto story. And so this story basically is vaguely in the, in the Don Valley ravine. Uh, homeless Ramona, in fact, isn't homeless. She's just a wacky old woman who lives in a Rosedale house, although it's not called Rosedale. 
Um, and and uh, so I wrote it, sent it into Storyteller, and got a very terse note back that said, "Not up to your regular quality. <laughs> not will not be published." I, well, you know, and there goes. You know, it was a. It was. I guess it was nasty in context. I was confused. I wrote back and said, "Really?" And I thought I liked it. I f- I flipped it to uh, a woman I had come to know through other stories, Janet Hutchings at Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine in, in New York. Um, and she published it immediately, uh, which, was, which was nice of her. And instead of paying me 35 bucks Canadian, it was $350 American. And when America might have been worth something. <laughs> <laughs> so I was pretty pleased by that, but I was still confused by, by, by this, this process. And I realized that, that and had had conversations after that, that this story you know, was not historical. It, it, it was in the present. It dealt with an issue that we maybe, uh, you know, because we, what Rita was saying that we, we tend to look away from rather than, than study. Tom Thompson's easy. You know, the Canadian story's been told a million times. It doesn't make what happened any better. But, it, you know, there's, there's a Canadian comfort to that. And I became convinced that, that, that people in this country, um, especially in Ottawa, perhaps, uh, uh, don't want to face that that this reality, you know, of of, uh, of 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 a homeless story. So I was disappointed. I sent it down. August two thousand and six, it was published in Ellery Queen, uh, and then this last year it finally it didn't win any story prizes, uh, but it won the Arthur Ellis Award for best short story in the country. So I was pretty pleased. With it. <laughs> Mark, I think you were going to say something, and I moderated right on top of you, so I apologize. Just after Dennis finished, you started to say something, or did I mistake that? Okay. Can I say something? You can say something. (laughs) I want to say a little bit about lies and truth, Um, because, so I've I've had a 35-year career in essentially current affairs television and a little bit of news thrown in. Uh, But I started life as an actor. The work I've been doing since um, is all true. It's all... In fact, I'm starting to call it uh, journal drama. Um, All I've done is uh, to collapse certain time frames um, and sometimes to combine characters... Uh, real life characters I've, I've, I've sometimes uh, taken what was four people and made them one person but um, I haven't made anything up now the germ of truth in the getaway car is that the people who were trapped were without transportation and, and, and that's the germ. Of, they were people without cars, essentially. Um, and, and that detail uh, stuck with me. It's also important to me in the Hurricane Katrina case that the Times Picayune of New Orleans predicted absolutely everything that happened three years before the hurricane, for which they won Pulitzer Prizes. And it didn't change a thing. This is something that has a lot of drama uh, for me as somebody who's worked in news and current affairs. That you can succeed to that extent and still, in essence, fail because you you haven't changed the outcome. We actually, uh, thank you, Rita. We actually have a question come comment over the web. Our first one from Susan Reynolds. Thank you, Susan who says this, I'm a writer and a teacher of creative writing. One of the groups I teach is incarcerated women in the provincial jail. I believe that a prime role of of story is to create empathy. And one of the ways we do that is by allowing others to experience what we experience sensuously. The short story we just heard, the plethora of detail in this made it live in my mind, my skin, my taste buds as I listened. I don't think that happens the same way with TV or film. Given that the author is a nonfiction filmmaker, I wonder if he could talk a bit about the use of detail in his films versus the inclusion of detail in short story. What influences his decisions of what details to include each 
and how are they different if they are? Answer any part of that you feel like. That's a great question. Susan, was it? Yes, Susan, Susan Reynolds, yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, I think we have, I think, no, Rita has just sort of said, I mean, you are the sum of where you've been, um, and, uh, and, and you carry everything forward with you. Um, my, I wouldn't say my favorite part of filmmaking, uh, or television making, um, I wouldn't say my favorite personal part of it is research, but I, I'm in awe of, of people who do it well, and I'm in awe of the depth of that. It would be a, a, a great disservice to, to an audience as, as a reader, um, uh, not, not to include that, that depth of detail. Uh, my job, if I can step outside of it, is to get you, a, as a reader, to have great affection uh, for Ramona's kind of imperious attitude in the light of her living in a depressed society, um, you know, and and, uh, and and Ray and and the general, and and I'm really big on developing character in place. I'm a big fan of, of place, uh, so I, I spend a lot of time researching that. Yeah, I, I mean, I went down to the food bank when it was at the bottom of Bathurst, not to research this. I just went down there one day, you know, and, and it stuck with me. Um, but I, but I do want to maintain, um, I, I do want to maintain the, the, the joy of being able to, to, to not be exactly truthful. Uh, you know, it, it, as much as that is, there is no divvy day down there. I mean, that's all made up. They're, they don't let people in like that. There are a bunch of washrooms out by the back door that were all lined up, and it was cold when I was there. But, but I find that, that what I've brought forward from filmmaking uh, is um, that I don't necessarily have to express everything about the subject in the story, uh, but I need to know it all to be able to, to tell that story properly. Uh, I think that, that you know, it's very true with, with, with Ted's research into very factual journalistic uh, you know, and recorded history and unrecorded history I mean, out of, uh, out of the vets you talk to, uh, you know, and all our abilities float around this, this, this what, what we bring together. I didn't realize until I talked to the Canadian Authors Association that I'm not really a crime writer at all. I'm, I'm a writer who sort of uses crimes to catch people's attention, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know and then I sort of spew out my agenda, you know, uh, which has to do with large thoughts like, like undeserved celebrity or forgotten history um, or, or the fact that we walk past that elderly people are invisible that homeless people are invisible because we, we will not meet their eyes and yet here's a society that goes on within two miles of where we're sitting or within two feet of where we're sitting on the parkway stuck bitching about the traffic because we can't get home you know? uh, and this whole, this whole world is going on so I I the other aspect with relation to Susan's question that, that I enjoy is that this, what, what I'm doing and, and doing passionately, to me, is an escape from everything I've done. Music and theater, uh, 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 school, uh, filmmaking are all pursuits that involve other human beings, whether you like it or not. When you sit down with a blank piece of paper and a keyboard, two fingers, because that's how I learned to do it. Um, uh, you're all by yourself. And I enjoy so much that utter isolation. And no matter how many... I read to everybody. Um, I have another theory about the television. Or when you watch television, you know, you watch what's on that screen one-to-one 50 times. The relationship is not 50-to-one. You can't watch it collectively. It's an individual thing. You can't read it collectively or hear it collectively because you put it through your own thoughts, whether you've been to Bathurst Street or whether you live in Rosedale. Everybody has their own baggage that, that they, they lend to it. So it's my job to give it a place that you can enter. Uh, and I'm big on, on place. That's a short answer. It was a long question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just <laughs> since it... Since it's Halloween, should we tell them who Arthur Ellis is that the Crime Fiction Award is named after? It's a good story, yeah, isn't it? Arthur Ellis was the last, is a pseudonym uh, for the last uh, hangman in Canada. 
They called himself <laughs> Arthur Ellis. I can't remember what his real name was. I think it was Arthur something else. You know, like that. But he was good with knots. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. If I can finish off just yes. on Halloween, I've got a, I just thought, speaking of everything I said about place and character, I've got a poem. So it's not very long. Uh, and it's a poem. I thought, you know, what would happen... I don't know why I thought this. What would happen if they were, if they made coffins that didn't rot, and so things inside them were trapped inside them? So this is called Final Escape, and I'll then we'll move on. Muffled men in rubber boots are digging late at night. They grunt with every pound of earth they shovel from the site. In dark cloth coats and baseball caps, considerate of death. Their flashlights cut the misty air and backlight puffs of breath. The stillness of the early hour makes loud the sounds of men. By shovelfuls, the pile grows higher. They buried deep back then. Now deeper dug and panting more, no one no longer talks. When flashlights freeze and breath is held as someone hits a box. Renewed, they dig around the sides and bring the thing to view. A fiberglass sarcophagus, the handles rusted through. A plastic job, the rage back then, says one who seems to know. No dust leaks out, no worms get in. It makes the process slow. From far above, a winch comes down to soiled, sweating men who take the weight and slip the straps beneath the coffin's ends. Then out they climb, the webbing strains, the windless motor hums. A moment stop, it's stuck, says one. Then up the long box comes. Beside its pit, the coffin sits, still stained from years below. It seems at misty, thickened dawn to cast a ghastly glow. No one speaks, but all move up, each elbowing for view. A small man with a piece of steel busts out the rusted screws. The flashlights pan the bones and dust, the tie clasp and the threads. Unseen, unheard, a wraith escapes and screams above their heads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's scary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mark. Mark is going to tell us something about storytelling and visual arts, specifically painting, I believe, and there is a painting behind him. I have another painting of Paris Hilton. We're holding up. Carl Jr.'s hamburger, she's in a bikini, she's got the diamonds on, and the whole painting is such an odd dichotomy of class and trash and imagery and, you know, what exactly is being communicated. Um, I do large paintings of uh, celebrity, I do Tom Selleck, and there's a, a transsexual performer out of New York named Amanda Lepore, who um, has had so much work done, she's used her physicality as this art form with um, her collagen and her plastic surgeries and so I find this to be another story of what are people communicating about themselves through their augmentation, through their transformation um, and how does that relate to the person inside? Now specifically this piece, my Jackson came out of um, a paparazzi image that was taken at the trial uh, the last one in Los Angeles where Michael Jackson was um, on trial <coughs> Sentencing day, the whole family showed up, and everybody was in Armani, and they looked beautiful, and oops, just, there was this very powerful kind of um, message of solidarity, family, money, power, wealth, okay? And he was acquitted. You know, in the States, justice is um, a little fluid sometimes. So this picture was taken, I believe, when the family was leaving, and um, I have certainly um, maybe added in certain areas, but that was basically what the photograph looked like. You know, there's Latoya in the front, Michael's in the back, and then you had Janet in the middle. And in terms of their, their physical presence, Janet still looks like she did, you know, 20 years ago, pretty much, you know. If you compare pictures of Michael, with himself 20 years ago, you would not see the same person. Same with Latoya. I mean, she was like, I have to tell people who that is. Because <laughs> she looks completely different. And it's like college and Botox and you name it. Right? So for me, um, 
that sort of pop culture river that we are constantly being exposed to is um, an interesting source for my inspiration. Um, and, you know, on one hand, the, the things about Brittany and um, Lindsay Lohan, I mean, it seems like all this fluff. But then on the other side, these are human beings and their celebrities impacting their lives, obviously. And what costs do people pay for their celebrity? And um, where's the humanity? So that's sort of where I'm at with my work right now. Judging by the, the image of Michael, it looks like he's become the ghost of his own celebrity in a, in a sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that I didn't. I mean, in terms of skin tones and value, that was what the photograph looked like. I did not lighten him any more than the photograph represented. Does anyone um, in the audience have questions or comments for Mark about his painting or what he just said? He only covers celebrities? He um, only covers celebrities? Um, no, I also um, will do work with, I do some printmaking work of um, people in cities. Um, I do other types of stories as well, but they're more quieter stories. Than this is sort of the, the flashy stuff that I do. There's, there's, there's a lot more on your website, too. I mean, a lot of, 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 of more examples of, of this. What's the, the transsexual thing? She's wonderful. Amanda Lepore. Yeah, yes, she's, she's amazing. She's definitely like her own art product, you know, through her. And I admire her. I think she's great. I'm actually meeting her at Christmas when I'm heading down there. And I do a lot of work around her, and I've done a lot of drawings, and so I'm going to be meeting her and talking to her about her, like getting her personal um, take on where she's coming from. I have a list of questions that I want to ask her about. You know, did she still have her Adam's apple and stuff like that? But as a painter, you know, I'm sort of looking at the photograph to see what's still here, you know. What's your website? It's markoconnell.ca. No. The website is markoconnell.ca? Yes. Yeah. Chris, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, looking at Mark's painting, and, and, and Mark refers to it as a, um, you know, a photograph, which is, which is to me, as far as far as away from a photograph as I can possibly think, because there's something going on in Mark's interpretation of that photograph, which is very much a statement, which um, I find it very interesting. I mean, it's just. It's just, it, it really embodies that uh, the idea of what the painter's role as a storyteller is, in a way, which is, I kind of compare it to, you know, in, in the documentary work that I do. I mean, you know, any particular subject matter that I be, might be working on, um, it's my filter that's capturing what's in there. <laughs> the data retrieval, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, you know, and I, maybe you can comment on that. I mean. You pick certain things, but what goes through your mind when when you come to make the painting? Like, what is it that makes the painting what it is for you? Well, for this one, um, there's certain aspects of directed eye movement that were already inherent in the photo image that I started with, and the fact that the everybody was wearing gold, and um, there was a very golden image that they presented. So in terms of the actual painting, I've done a series of varnishes to get, there's actually like a gold finish it's to this luminous. whole piece. So it glows a little bit. So that was definitely part of it. <laughs> you know, the, the idea of luxury, you know, and then she's looking at him and he's looking out here, right? Like he's not looking back at the viewer or at his family. But that was actually in the original photograph. Mm. You know, I mean, there's always going to be some... Um, for me as a painter I technically there's always going to be some distortion because there's only so much you can do you know I mean you, the hand of the artist is going to going to change things and so I sort of welcome that aspect of my process as well to see what's kind of going to come in it's like telling almost like another story you know you come with one idea you know, I have drawings I knew what it was going to look like and then it ends up looking like a different painting Right, that sort of happens as an intuitive process when you're actually making art. One, one of the contradictions in that painting is that although they're a family and they're together, they're very different not only in skin tone and where they're looking, but in, but in affect. It's like they're three different people unrelated who are caught in a yeah. moment, yet you know the relation under, underneath it too. 
well, it, you know, I mean, I thought it was admirable that his family showed up for him in some ways. I thought, that's nice. You know, like, I would want my family to show up for me in the same way. You know, so there was that, that I'd do the human scale of it. Photo op, what the heck? Well, I don't know. It wasn't a good photo op. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have this mega celebrity aspect thrown in. You know, so for me, I mean, Janet as the focal point, this relatively normal looking woman, I mean, she's lovely to look at, but she's always been pretty. I mean, she hasn't radically transformed herself. And she still, you know, looks like someone you might know. Whereas the other two, you know, I don't know people that look like that. So many of the friends in that story. Uh, a couple questions. Do you always base your paintings on photographs? Does Pretty much. Does base his paintings on photographs? And uh, when you're looking at a photograph, what, what makes it speak to you? What makes it paintable? Is it the, I guess, the flaws that give these people humanity or... Uh, for one thing, I look for that's a good question. Um, I look for a good likeness, okay? Because it's hard enough to get it to look like your subject. So it has to really, in the original source image, really say to me, "This is Michael Jackson," or "This is Paris Hilton." Okay? Because I sometimes see some great shots that really don't look that much like the subject, and forget it. If you go to paint that, it's not going to happen. So that I will look for. And then this had a nice compositional sense. It was almost like a ready-made in terms of that. I came across some images of Lindsay Lohan on the internet where she and this other young woman are playing with knives and they're looking extremely, you see those pictures where they're looking really buzzed and you know, they're holding knives to his necks and they're kind of half undressed and they're just so surreal as images. So I thought, wow, this is like totally my kind of painting. So like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all public domain and then I go and I sort of will obviously reinterpret it, but so an image that is already pretty strong and that you will be able to identify as a viewer, so you'll have your backstory that you'll bring with it to the work really helps for me. Like I did a big Tom Selleck, and my students who I'm teaching um, are about 19 or 20, and they didn't know who he was, some of them. Right, so finally I said, mm-hmm. said Monica's boyfriend on Friends, and they're like, oh, Friends. <laughs> <laughs> like there was no baggage connection, which for me, you know, being a teenager in the 80s, it was all about, you know, I, I you know, people my age here would totally get Magnum, so I had to bring in the other reference for that. You know. Uh, Rita wanted to say something, and we have another message on email. Uh, we'd also better give Ted a chance before we reach our two-hour limit, but uh, Rita? Just a question. Do you have any sense of why plastic surgery is called work? You just used that expression. I've been puzzled by this for the last two weeks. Why, why do you think it's called work? I don't know. Um, <laughs> get work done is just the way we refer to it in design. Um, hmm. Hmm. Work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Getting work on your house. It's yeah. the same kind of thing. You know, upgrading and updating and uplifting. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did have a couple of students who put their hands up. Yes. She's asking how Mark's work will change when he has a chance to interview the trans person he's talking about. Yeah, I would like to, um, you know, as I work harder on my paintings, my technique gets better. So I would like to do, you know, very representational work of her and try to get some of the humanity and the personal psychology in the portraits that I'm going to be working on of her. You know, because I think that she... Has t- it's taken a lot of courage for her to totally like regender herself and re um, configure her face and her everything. It's just a completely different um, person that she's created, you know, through that through say, that plastic surgery. So I would definitely like to kind of get the balance of who's inside versus this really quite amazing and unusual looking outside. Uh, we have a, another uh, email. This is from Melanie McBride, uh, and she writes this. I'm a fellow storyteller educator who teaches here at the college. I just attended the first part of your talk, and now I'm following it virtually from a computer. Though the web has opened up the possibility of personal broadcasting via participatory media, there is still a digital divide. Beyond money, time, and technology, there is the privilege or entitlement to simply speak to simply feel the right to have a voice. This barrier is invisible to those of us who grow up in any context of privilege, whether educational, cultural, socioeconomic, or otherwise. 
My question to all of you is this. What statements of empowerment can any of you offer to those of us who wish to take part but do not feel qualified or authorized to do so by education, class, race, etc.? What internal beliefs about yourself as creative people and storytellers help you claim the right to have a voice? A big question. Wow. Does anyone have a response? The right to have a voice. It's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? Well, the right to have a voice has certainly been enhanced by the existence of the Internet. And, it's, and, and Melanie and I have discussed this as recently as today. And that is the, the nature of uh, who has access to it, how people use it, and uh, how it might be um, guided or edited or uh, supervised. And, and I would suggest that the state of the Internet now, as unbridled as it virtually is, gives anyone access to make a statement and if they uh, gain the credibility of being um, part of a group of artists, a group of bloggers, a group of teachers, students, where there is credibility, then that enhances their ability to be heard and to be recognized and respected. Uh, so maybe, but oddly enough, by your association in that group of people on the internet, you gain credibility and voice. And if someone with influence pays attention, then you move to the next published level, perhaps. That's, remember, I'm talking from, you know, print side and as a published author, that's what I'd be looking for. I, I've never, I, I've, all, I've always felt entitled to, to, to have an opinion. Um, and I guess, like, through filmmaking and just through that process, I've always felt entitled to express that that opinion, whether or not it is mine or, or, or that of others, or whether it's just a search for, for, for some kind of, kind of truth. I also realized, you know, from that question, that, that uh, teaching here in broadcasting and film, and I'm sure this is true with Chris, who, who, who's my colleague in doing that, um, that I spent an inordinate amount of time Ensuring that my students feel entitled to 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 participate, to, to put in, they, you know, that their poems are as good as my poems, their films are as good as my films, and and I think what that allows me to do is because it's a relatively uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, population that, that that you know that comes to attend, mm -hmm. that takes out sort of any any residual guilt I feel about. Growing up a white Irish guy in southern Ontario, you know that that I that I actually am entitled within a relatively narrow world uh, to to express opinion uh, you know, about that which I know and, and with which I'm comfortable. And yet, through these students and with these students, I'm, I'm, I'm able to expand that not only in me, but to ensure that they they do feel some entitlement to to, to speak up, whether it's in film or prose or music or art or or theater or whatever. Thank you. Um, it, um, there is a digital divide, and uh, there's, there, there's always been a relatively narrower group of people who control the tools of communication. But it's interesting that what uh, digital technologies also permit is uh, a lot more junk a lot more spam and a lot more people who in fact have nothing to say. Um, so I think there is still, uh, not still, there is always a responsibility. Everyone is entitled, but I think what buys you that entitlement is to check that you actually have something to say that what you're about to say is going to reach at least from you to one other person. And I think that's a responsibility that goes with the available technologies. Chris? Uh, I was just going to add that um, in the digital um, profusion of um, 
uh, available places for people to express themselves, um, something interesting happens, which uh, and and it sort of it, it skirts a little bit on on Rita's point, but um, I remember the day. <laughs> and put myself in a certain age here. I remember the day when we had to use typewriters. Now, there was something interesting happened with writing when word processors became the way to do things. Uh, suddenly, you know, people were calling themselves writers. Now, you're journalists. The people who are sitting in the audience here are journalists. I, I think most of you are journalists. Um, you know, as we know, the, f the, the, the media forum does not define who you are. And so, you know, <laughs> if you go to YouTube or any of the other sort of uh, uh, huge places like this, the one thing that, that's great about it is it's hugely democratizing. And so it breaks the divide down. That I really like. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, uh, sort of web authoring right now, you know, as, as, as horrible and, and sort of as, as simple as some of the applications are for creating your own websites, it's now possible for any person to create a website. You can go and, and create it for yourself in about five minutes. Whereas, let's say, even two or three years ago, you needed, you know, a bunch of webmasters in a mysterious room to do that. So we keep changing that form and we keep democratizing down and down and down and down. So this is where it ties into Rita's point because the, then, of course, the, the pipe is huge and you know anybody can enter the pipe. So I think they, the, the, the idea around uh, democratization of media is a great thing and not to be underestimated at all. Um, you know, I, some of the sites that, uh, that I would say that I admire for their um, the bravado, you know, where video journalists, let's say, for example, are, you know, in some, you know, frontline location and they're able to transmit a story to us. Um, yes, there's, you know, there's some infrastructure that they're using that makes them special, but this couldn't have happened even at the lowest level sorry, at the highest level uh, some years ago. Now it's happening at the lowest level. So you as journalists, uh, even with a simple uh, video camera, could be reporting from a location somewhere a far afield an important story, and it would be easy for you to do it. So that's fine. Thank you. Um, we have one more uh, question from uh, Ross Perigo in Montreal, but since it's a general question and Ted has been waiting here so patiently, I do want to include his participation. I just want to tell a very short story first. If you notice, Ted is wearing a poppy. The reason why people wear poppies to uh, commemorate the sacrifice of people who fought in the wars is because a guy named John McCrae, who lived a block away from where I grew up in Guelph, wrote a poem called In Flanders Field, that became kind of an emblem of what happened in World War I, and he mentioned the poppies blowing in the field despite the shelling and the war and everything. So it's that poem that is the source of the poppy that is a symbol of the sacrifice of war and what the veterans still among us and so on, which Ted is wearing. So, Ted, you're going to tell us something. I'm going to move this back. Do you mind if I stand? Um, I want to talk about storytelling from two perspectives, uh, the story itself and the getting the story, which I think for this group and for all of us ultimately is equally important. Um, the First World War was uh, an extraordinary um, period. It's called the Great War in most of the minds of those who, have, who are knowledgeable more, more so than I. Um, and I came to print um, from broadcast. And so the tool of my research has always been a recording, an interview. And so I've always had that uh, wonderful luxury of sitting down with somebody, turning on the tape recorder, and then mining the memories to get the stories that become the stories in my books. The Great War happened too long ago for me to do that. And so when I put together the current book, which has come out in this 90th year of the anniversary of Vimy Ridge, I was working entirely from letters, diaries, all written sources, 
I spoke to nobody who witnessed what I recorded in this book. And so I was left with very traditional means of researching, going to, through personal letters, digging through archives, going to museums, contacts, and so on. And so the story I want to tell you today is the story of unearthing one of the stories at Vimy that no one has talked about before or rarely, and how I got the story. Quickly, Vimy was a battle that took place between the 9th and 12th of April, 1917. The Canadians came into the Western Front, which was a long battle line from the coast of France to the, it's about 500 kilometers long, to the Swiss Alps. The Canadians were told in December of 1916 it would be their job in the center of this new offensive to come at Easter to take Vimy Ridge from the Germans. And uh, Vimy Ridge, if you, for those of you who know Toronto, if you stand at the corner of Avenue Road and Bloor Street and look north up Avenue Road towards St. Clair, there's a long, slow incline, right, to St. Clair, about maybe three or four kilometers away. If you took away every building, every tree, every lamppost, every obstruction between Bloor and St. Clair, and then looked to the right and left of you for roughly five or six kilometers, 10 miles or 10 kilometers of open space between where the Germans were at the top at St. Clair and the Canadians were at Bloor Street and nothing to protect you. That's what faced the Canadians on the morning of the 9th of April, 1917. Uh, it was their job to prepare the battlefield, literally from December of 1916 until the battle began on the 9th of April. I won't tell you all of the incredible innovations and um, inventions that the Canadians came up with to succeed in taking that ridge. But it was a series of decisions made by Julian Bing, who was the British commander of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in France, and the commander of the 1st Canadian Infantry uh, Division, Arthur Curry. They realized that the Canadians were, were task-oriented, that they didn't know about saluting and creased pants and the King's regulations. Their job as volunteers was to complete a task, and that's why they were there. And so they were given the jobs of excavating underground to prepare the trenches and the railway lines and the taking in of men and supplies and the taking out of wounded and so on for that four-day battle. They didn't know how long it would be, but they knew it was going to be um, quite a siege. And so one of the elements of that strategy was to make sure that the system was prepared for wounded. And the generals expected there would be probably anywhere from 60 to 80,000 casualties. I'll remind you that in attempts to take Vimy Ridge by the French and the English prior to the Canadians being there, they had lost 140,000 casualties. So at the end of the stream of bringing back the wounded, there would be uh, medics in the field, in the battlefield, in no man's land. There would be um, stretcher bearers bringing wounded to the front trenches, from there to the, the uh, forward aid stations, to then to small units, which we might now refer to as mass units, and then if they were unsuccessful or unable to treat men, from there to a railway station, and then 60 miles to the coast of France to a place called Etat. And I found in my research, and I don't know if we can bring up a photograph that is available, I found, there it is there, I found this photograph of an ambulance driver, a woman, in the Canadian War Museum. But prior to that, and what stimulated my interest in the photograph was I was sitting at the National Archives, one of the many places I went to get these written records, and I came across references of the CBC's recording, again, my sort of primary uh, research source. I went to the CBC, and in 1960, three men, um, J. Frank Willis, one of the earliest reporters for the CBC, for CBC Radio, um, A. E. Powley, who was involved in taking the overseas unit to, the, to, to England and establishing the CBC's overseas broadcasting capability in the Second World War, and another man. And in 1960, they spread out across the country and they interviewed hundreds of great war veterans. So at that point, they were in their 70s and 80s. Any of you who've worked in television and radio will know that for every foot of audio tape or film that gets broadcast, there is a dozen that don't. Somebody in their wisdom took the interviews that these three men gathered in their travels across the country 
and transcribed every word of every veteran's interview, even the words that were not used in the broadcast that was to follow in 1964. And when I came across in the, this in the archives, I said to the archivist, can I get the material of these transcripts from the great war veterans? Certainly, there's a lot of it, he warned me. And I said, fine, bring it all. And if you've been to the National Archives these days, you have to bring it out of Quebec. It's in a bunker, in, it's in a concrete bunker in uh, the Laurentians, and it takes a day to get it all down. The next day, there were 33 boxes <laughs> of transcripts of those interviews from here to the back of the room. And I, start, I was like a kid in a candy store, going through all these wonderful transcripts. Now, I had already searched across the country for the stories. Anyway, in the boxes, I found a file marked ambulance driver. And it was labeled Mrs. David Livingston. <laughs> What's her name? It's not David, and her married name is Livingston. Anyway, I go through the transcript, 40-odd pages, wonderful stuff. She was on the receiving end at a top when the first wounded, after midnight, on the night of the 9th of April, 1917, receiving the wounded. It was her job to move the wounded in her ambulance from the railway station across five kilometers of cobblestone roads to the hospital. There were 50,000 hospital beds waiting for the wounded. And I don't know who this woman's name is, what this woman's name is. I go through the transcript and about halfway through, she's relating a story um, of a colleague speaking with her. And the other woman says, oh, Grace, da 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 And I realized it was Grace, married name, Livingston. So now I, and I knew that from the transcript that she'd come from Vancouver. So I thought, a, a First World War veteran, Vancouver, the Vancouver Library, the Victoria Provincial Archives. I start calling and send out all of the possible um, you know, hounds to find who Grace Livingston is. Nothing. In frustration, I go to Google. And I write in, First World War Ambulance Driver Woman. Second name up is Grace McPherson. <laughs> the day I found her transcript in the 33 boxes, I went to the Canadian War Museum just down the road in Ottawa. I found this photograph. I didn't know who it was. Guess who it is? Grace McPherson. Sometimes researchers are just damn lucky. <laughs> now, her story. Grace McPherson grows up in Vancouver. When the war breaks out in 1914, she tells her parents, I'm going to serve. And I'm going to serve as an ambulance driver in the Red Cross. She knew that certainly that she was going to do it. Problem was, she had to get to England. She wrote to the British Red Cross. She wrote to Ottawa for assistance. Nobody was interested in helping her. She saved up her money, and in 1916, she has enough for transatlantic passage to London. She gets a job in the Canadian barracks dispensing checks to the soldiers who are in London on leave. She's there so long that the soldiers kid her about the fact that she's been there so long and is not going to realize her dream of driving ambulance, and they keep kidding her about it. They say, Grace, the war's going to be over, and you're still going to be handing out checks. <laughs> So in her frustration, she finds, she seeks out the commander of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, Sam Hughes, the Minister of Militia. He happens to be in London when she's there. She seeks him out, gets an interview at the Savoy Hotel. He's in the presidential suite with what she describes in the transcript as a bunch of cross swords, generals, because they had cross <laughs> swords on their, on their uh, collars. She walks in and she describes in this transcript what happened. She says... Sir Sam, Sir Sam Hughes, I want to serve in the British Red Cross. I wonder if you'll help me. And he's sitting with all these generals around him and he knows that he has to make a statement. And he blusters under, no conditions will I allow a woman to go to the front. Your, your request is, is denied. And she says, but I've come all this way and I've come here by myself. I've done it my, myself. And he refuses her. He says, there's no way that you'll get a chance to go to the front. And she says as she leaves the presidential suite, Sir Sam... With your help or without it, I will serve. And she leaves. Two things happened that changed the, the dynamics of that picture within weeks of that interview. One, Sam Hughes was implicated in a kickback scheme <laughs> in which uh, the men who were selling rif Ross rifles to the Canadian Expeditionary Force were implicated, and he was implicated. And secondly, his tactics from early on in the war were being eclipsed. <coughs> Consequently, he was removed, and one of the things, the changes that were made 
uh, on the entry of the new uh, commander of the expeditionary force was that men who were driving ambulances at a top could be better serving the war effort closer to the front. The ambulance driver's seats were emptied and the women took over and Grace McPherson got her wish. And so she served and much of the rest of the transcript is about her experience at Vimy and elsewhere and she talks about being stoic on the night of the ninth, dealing with the wounds. She was responsible not only for uh, the maintenance of the vehicle, she had to actually maintain the engine. She actually put the wounded in the box in the back and she had to repair the flats whenever the tires, which were notorious for going flat, went flat. And she did it for 14 shillings a week for a year and a half. And she said her proudest moment, her proudest moment was acknowledging that on her shoulder was the Canadian patch. Quick footnote. My book is published back in February. After all my work going through all these archives and all of the luck finding her name and the rest of it and the photograph, several months after the book comes out, I get a phone call. It's actually a message from a Diana Filer. And I know this name from my broadcasting life. And I call her back. I said, Diana, your name is familiar from CBC. She said, yes, she'd been a unit manager at CBC. And I said, why are you calling? She had seen an excerpt of the book in the National Post. I had run a, a several of them the week of leading up to the anniversary in April. And I said, she said she really enjoyed reading the piece about Grace McPherson. I said, why? She said she was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and so I now have Grace's diaries. And I'm now working on a book about my journey with veterans. How their stories are not just what they have to offer, but meeting them and sharing with them the experience of looking back, sometimes reluctantly, sometimes painfully, um, is as much a worthwhile exploration as the stories they had to tell. Yes? How do you spell um, uh, capital M A C capital P H E R S O N. McPherson. At the middle there. You. Where, yeah. Where did your interest in this aspect of Canadian history come from? Well, I've done. I, I, I accidentally, Abby, fell into writing about uh, Canadian wartime experience. And it's not because I'm, a, I'm fascinated with war and, and a warmonger and war is glorious and all that sort of thing, just the opposite. I'm fascinated by people who are living on the edge. And that's what happens in warfare. Is, and uh, um, one of, uh, a man whom, with whom I've struck up a very close friendship since I met him 20 years ago, Charlie Fox, who's a uh, decorated Spitfire pilot, he said to me that every he was flying over the Normandy beaches on the morning of June the 6th, D-Day, 1944, and his brother was going in on one of the landing craft and he was providing cover and he said, every sense in my body was acute. We, everything was just elevated and we were living life on the edge. And it just amplifies why these stories are so compelling. But they're real people. And what a lot of people don't realize in addition to that is that and this has a lot to do with the very basic element of storytelling. I've never or rarely gone to the officers in military situations to get the stories because they're covering their backsides <laughs> generally when they write about their experience. I've always talked to or managed to find those men and women who are just rank and file Canadian volunteers. 90% uh, of those Canadians who served overseas in the Great War and in the Second World War, volunteered to go there. They left their families, their lives, their careers, in many cases their lives behind them to serve in this remarkable cause they felt was important. In the First War it was an adventure and that's part of the intrigue of studying these people too. But in the Second World War it was much clearer. And to go to their diaries and listen to them speak about the experience of ordinary people doing extraordinary things to me is so captivating and I hope it comes out in the six or eight books I've done on Canadian wartime experience. When did that first strike you? When? Yeah, like when did you turn the corner? Well, I'm going to write about war now. Uh, probably with that very same guy, uh, Charlie Fox. I, among his, my encounter with him, I wanted to tell a story on radio. And I went to um, a place called Tilsonburg, 
in southwestern Ontario where an organization called the Canadian Harvard Aircraft Association uh, resides. Harvard Aircraft were the training aircraft that were used during the Second World War to train uh, pilots. And I saw all these old guys tinkering with the Harvard, trying to get it airborne mm -hmm. again. And what I discovered while I was down there, I was just going to do a two or three minute story on these guys, you know, these nice old men playing with this lovely yellow aircraft from 50 years ago. And it turned out that some of the guys tinkering with the aircraft had been instructors in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And I sensed there was a story that had never been told and these guys were totally invisible, giving an Air Force its wings, literally. They trained a quarter of a million men. It was Canada's largest uh, wartime expenditure in the Second World War. We spent two and a quarter billion dollars training air crew here and I thought, there's a story. And he was my conduit. And I found instructors took a long time because they've been invisible since the war. So I, and that challenged me. I'm always wanting to take on a challenge, to find these people and get them to tell their stories. And that was among the first. So it's not really a war story, is it? It's about people and their drive to do what they feel is important. So then you had to find the next one? Kind of yeah, and, I, and, and little by little, like a tree. One contact led to a couple more, led to many more. And before long, I had four or five hundred instructors in that first book about warfare and, and, and Canadian experience in wartime. We have someone else who's been waiting patiently, and that's Ross Perigo from Montreal. So I'd perhaps better read his question now. Um, I'm enjoying your storytelling approaches as I watch you here in Montreal where I teach journalism. It seems to me that you are, all are speaking about how to communicate successfully and memorably. As a people, we have been telling stories around the campfire for about 45,000 years. And we have learned that to tell a memorable story, you need to choose a moment where there is tension and conflict, a seminal moment, if you will. In telling the story, we do more than talk about a single event. We transcend the individual event and generalize to embrace a great number of similar events. And in so doing, we express our humanity. The problem is, with such a rich oral tradition, with our brains trained to tell stories for so long, how do we train our minds to write these ideas down? Or is it best to say the stories for a while until we can refine our ideas into a compelling tale? And that was the question or the comment. Can you that last bit again? Yeah, if I can find it, I don't know what I just did here. <laughs> In telling the story, we do more than talk about a single event. We transcend the individual event and generalize to embrace a great number of similar events. And in doing so, we express our humanity. How do we train our minds to write these ideas down? Or is it best to say the stories for a while until we refine our ideas into a compelling tale? Can I, I'll just, a very quick uh, response uh, to Ross. Um, I, uh, in, in 2004, I wrote a book about the D-Day landings and the Canadian role there. It's called Juno, which was the code name for the beach. I started, and, and it was published in 2004, I started gathering stories in 1969. And I can remember the morning. It was the anniversary. It was June the 6th, 1969. I was on the air at an all-night uh, radio program, and Ross knows where that was, in Lindsay, Ontario. Nobody was listening. And at about 5 in the morning, I hear a knock downstairs, and I go downstairs, and in the sunlight of the early morning, there's a man standing there, fully uniformed, and I open the door, because this was a two-story building. I open the door, and I, I can hear the record ending upstairs almost. And I said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And he said, the Canadians have landed. He was reliving the D-Day experience and telling me, and I couldn't stop long enough to get his story, because the record was ending upstairs. And I dashed, I thanked him, dashed upstairs, and, and I was smitten. To me, the story, to have a man 40 years later come out and say that, or whatever it was, um, it meant it was dramatic enough that I should make note of it. And from that moment on, I gathered D-Day stories, which led to my book three years ago. Just Chris? A, a kind of a, an interesting uh, comment. Um, Ted mentioned the British Commonwealth Air Training Program, and um, uh, I worked on a story, um, did a story about the Lancaster bomber uh, for a, a television show called Flight Path. And um, so this relates to the question because um, you know when uh, when you're when you're presented with a kind of a situation and you know okay I was working for somebody but I still was responsible for the story as the director of the program and um, 
you know, when you are on the trail <laughs> of the story, it's like nothing will stop you from getting this story. So two things happened on this particular story. We were trying to um, paint this portrait that out west, where we were centering our story, that um, there was a lot of young men trained out there and, and women too, but uh, um, the legacy still lives on there. So um, one of the things, and this is where I think you know you have to just you know keep your ears open because at the time that you're investigating a story and something comes up, if you follow it, you don't know where it's going to lead you, but usually you know something tells you that it smells right. So somebody referred us over to the High River local airfield. Well, there's some guys over there who are... Um, South of Calgary. Yeah. Who are... Uh, uh, you should go meet this guy. So I called this guy up and he said, oh yeah, he's got a tiger moth. Tiger moth is what they used to train these young pilots on. It's an aircraft that if the wind is blowing as it does up there... Uh, you can't keep them on the ground. The chain them <laughs> the ground. So there's a guy you should go meet. So I call this fellow up and he says, yeah, I'll come and meet you. How would you like to go for a ride in one of these planes? <laughs> you know? So um, we chat for a while and, uh, you know, he's 85 years old. And, and when he was 19, he trained all these men. You know? So you never know <laughs> where things are going to lead you. Uh, and they kept the best pilots so that they could train all these, I call them, you know, expendables, but a lot of these pilots, they weren't the best pilots that were sent over because they had to keep the, 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 the very best ones to, to use to train all of the other folks who were going over. It's just, you know, one of those experiences you kind of go like, yes, this has to be a part of the story. And so, of course, he, he, he became part of the story. Dennis? I think it's sort of like asking people in a way where do their ideas come from you know and, and, and writers tend to shy away from that it, although I don't because I think it's a really interesting question and, and I think they come from um, uh, most of the the, the the people I know who communicate are, are kind of information junkies and news junkies and I think we go through life and we collect thoughts you know we collect thoughts about uh, events we collect thoughts about celebrity we collect thoughts about um, history and, and so on uh, and you start to, to, to realize is that really what we're collecting as, as, as Canadians not to raise too many flags but uh, we're collecting bits and pieces of our culture I don't know a documentary filmmaker in the history of this country who hasn't made a film that had to do with some war sometime because that's very very much about who we are and very very much until recently I think about how, how we, we measure ourselves uh, and, and you come and you tell those stories and become a fabric whether or not th th they become you know, exhaustively researched um, like Ted's stuff or, or sort of you know, I would read his book and steal from it I I in a way I, I've just you wouldn't a, be the first yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've just got a little piece here which I didn't steal from you that, that as, as an example of that of, of a storytelling thing this is back to the story about the guy who killed Tom Thompson. And, mm -hmm. and, and the reason he killed him is that the park, was, he really felt it was his. He grew up there. And, um, and he went away, and he went away to war. Um, and he came back, and in the short time uh, he'd been away uh, serving his country, uh, Tom Thompson's career had expanded, and, and things were different when he got back. So uh, and this is his sort of deathbed confession about what happened. It's not very long. I never talked much about the Great War then, and I don't now. I ended up in the goddamn mud with the Canadian Corps on Easter Monday, 1917. Four days later, we took Vimy Ridge, 120 yards high, about the same as that granite outcrop just west of where Mowat used to be. I got shot in the right thigh and fell down in a muck bog that went on to the horizon. I was dreaming I was a pure white otter, diving down deep in the cool, clean water of a two-loon lake. When somebody flipped me onto my back, saved my life, I would have drowned it right there. I came home in July with a silver medal, a pension, a limp, and an army issue cane. At first, not much seemed changed. The fat deer flies swarmed around my head just out of range like always. The hot purple and burnt cloud sunset shadows on the lakes were the same ones 
I'd been thinking about all the time I was away. Maybe they were even more beautiful for that. The lodge was bigger and packed with more visitors than ever. The chip yard was growing in fast with weedy poplars and runt balsams. From the dock I saw the painter zigzagging his way up Canoe Lake like an amateur. But it wasn't until he got close that I saw he had my chestnut canoe, except he'd painted her gray. He shouted my name and put his arms around me like a bear and hugged me and banged on my back like I was a relative or something. He talked about all the paintings he'd done and sold, how all his pals were coming up, how the park had been discovered. All I could smell was his shirt and his sweat, and all I could feel was my head getting hotter and hotter till my collar was soaking and my neck burned like a fuse in the cold afternoon wind. He didn't even ask me where I'd been. Things weren't at all the same, I saw. Maddie said the painter made some money guiding lodge guests around Canoe Lake in my chestnut. He'd passed his park ranger easy, which I didn't do, said the Irishman, and had been fire spotting on the east side all spring. They all seemed prouder of him than me, and I was from here, and I'd come home from away. It was like he'd taken over my park while I was gone. Never mind he couldn't paddle or find his own way to Black Bear. Never mind he couldn't catch a fish or trap a meal. Never mind he didn't go overseas. <laughs> the Irishman's wife watched me real close when she said Katie Matunin married Russell Dalton the minute he'd come back all gassed up. Lawrence Dalton hadn't come back at all, and I wished I hadn't either. <laughs> Where do you get um, phrases like a two loon lake a two -loon. and a brain blushing? I love that. <laughs> two loon lakes are special. They have two babies. <laughs> I, I, I hear that with Irish storytellers, whiskey has a lot to do with it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Read it. Um, just, um, I heard a question in there that was, since we are uh, oral people, uh, do we have to wait until we can write this down? Um, and I'm tempted to say, um, I think you have to decide whether, in fact, you are an oral storyteller uh, or a written storyteller or a photographic storyteller because uh, writing may not be either your ultimate destination, I mean, all, all of my work is, um, is for theater or, or for television, and even though it, it, it has a script, uh, it's meant ultimately to be oral. And the, the, the drama of your basic interview uh, remains for me to get other people to tell their stories in ways that are dramatic and compelling, I think is a, is a wonderful form of communication. And, and that's the, the form of, that's its ultimate destination. So um, I, I, I just w want to say that I think all stories are not meant to be written when they grow up. <laughs> they can be grown up <laughs> in other forms. Dance? Or must be, yeah. I think everybody here, I, I would <laughs> I think that, that when the story's matured to a point that you want to tell it in the way that you tell stories, um, you know, is, is part of that question. And, and I think you know when, when that is. But I could no longer stand up and do what you did with the getaway car or even talk as fluently standing up off the top of my head as, uh, as Ted or play a guitar at all, you know, or paint at all. <laughs> I, you know, I... I'm very narrow in in that, and that narrowness is some, you know is is, is a gift to a degree because it allows you to focus on that. But so everybody knows what a two loon lake is when you say <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm I'm going to uh, put in a, a plug for poetry here. I'm not actually supposed to tell my stories, but I'm the moderator, so what the hell. Um, <laughs> This is a story that comes from a, a time when I had a summer job painting houses, uh, like the outside, you know, not like good painting like Mark does, but like slapping on the latex kind of painting. So I'll just read this. It is a story, and there is a narrative in a lot of poetry. Under the eaves, I am making white again neglected boards 
under the eaves of the house where an old artist couple lived until the wife died first, the husband following a few months later. My toes curl around their aluminum ladders top rung. The vexed birds argue nearby that I'm too close to their nests in the weathered birdhouses the old couple nailed up in every tree. As sweat, sweat and latex spatter into my eyes, I'm ready to agree. My painting partner, working the front wall, tells me the old man's ghost sometimes creaks through the empty rooms. He didn't want to die. I hear no steps through the picture window's mirror in the din of Cardinal, Sparrow, and Robin, giving me an interloper's what for. But I almost see a wrinkled face angling through the glass saying, you call that painting, boy? Leave our birds alone. <laughs> We're almost out of time here. We've got three minutes of live web time left. Does anyone out there have a comment? Sir. What was the goal of today's storytelling webinar? Well, that's probably better for you to decide. Um, it's hard to see it from here. Uh, generally speaking, I, I, I think it was the fact that stories are everywhere and there are different ways to tell them and, and, and here are six ways to tell them. Maybe we can turn the question inside out. What did any of you get out of this, if anything? What did you find out about stories and storytelling that you didn't know before. She's saying that until today she assumed stories were always written, but in fact there's many different avenues and ways of, of telling stories and we represented some of them here. We built in the phrase storytelling into our sort of mission statement here at this school a few years ago um, because we recognize that telling stories is a part of any aspect of communication, whether it's advertising or it's visual art or it's uh, broadcast and film or journalism or corporate communications or book and periodical, all these um, active training areas take full advantage of good storytelling and I think what we're trying to do is illustrate that commonality and suggest that um, everybody has a story to tell, whatever you're doing. And that, that I mean, I, I remember several years ago, um, somebody uh, invited me to speak at a business conference about storytelling and I thought, <laughs> what do I do there? But um, essentially every business person in that audience had a story to tell and they just needed to be inspired to use them to express themselves and to accomplish the same professional goals. I just thought of another answer to Ross's question about when is the story ready to, ready to be told? And, and he reminded me because of that journalistic print aspect. And that is, is that when your editor says he needs it by noon on Friday. <laughs> 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 yes. I have one I want to give away because I'm sure I'm not going to do anything with this. Um, last week uh, I was on uh, some main street in Toronto and three policemen on bicycles went by. You know, the guys on bicycles with all their police stuff. And I looked down onto the street and there was horse manure. Now, <coughs> So presumably some mounted policemen went by ahead of these, but I was struck by how funny this was, the idea of these bicycles dropping manure. <laughs> I wish I had been a professional photographer and had my camera with me at that moment, but I'm not. Um, and I thought, there are a million stories in, in this little vignette about the history of Toronto and policing and how things have changed. And I'm sure I'm not going to do anything with that. I just think it's great, though. 
It would make a good Photoshop assignment. You get a shot of the police officers on the bicycle and a nice pile of steaming horse manure and just merge the two together. <laughs> We're up for our designated time, but uh, can you give us one more song to send us out? Do, oh, sure. do you want to do the one about the guy who worked on the Great Lakes Freighter or another yeah, one? Okay, sure. Okay. Um, this is a song that um, I guess you could say is... A little bit of a, a documentary song. It's uh, the idea was to, I was a little bit fascinated. A friend of mine had worked on the freighters, and uh, so I kind of knew a little bit like what the life was like. It's a pretty lonely life, and um, I also knew somebody else who was uh, searching for their father. So I kind of married the two stories together. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to Nate, especially, for thinking this up in the first place. To our wonderful technical crew who made this all work, I think. Uh, 
uh, to our participants. And don't forget the blog site, which is open for two weeks. So I guess that's to about November 14th at tc-centos, C-E-N-T-O-S, dot the center, that's spelled C-E-N-T-R-E, dot centennialcollege.ca slash WordPress. So if you want to follow up on this, add something, tell a story of your own, tell us all we're crazy, that's the place to do it.